Is it worth it? Is it worth being a builder? Yeah. A hundred percent. G'day guys, welcome back to another episode of Level Up. We are back in the shed this afternoon for another cracking episode. So um, something a little different this afternoon. So we've been reaching out and um, I guess putting the word out there to get a few young guys on, young guys or girls, whatever it may be. So um, because I'm really interested to hear their point of view about how they feel the industry works, how it operates, how they've been treated, all those types of things. So um, look, if you are a young guy or girl out there that's in the building industry, then make sure you shout out because we'd love to have you on. But um, today we've got Josh here. How are you, Josh? Hey, mate. Good. Awesome. So um, Josh reached out to me a while ago now. <coughs> like, I don't know, had to be four months maybe, about, five months? Oh, about maybe, yeah. T- two, to, two to three months ago, sent an email, sent a text, sent a message. So um, Josh reached out to me and uh, he's got ambitions to become a builder and reached out to me because he just he just wanted to have a chat and get some advice learn more about the industry and all those types of things and i said mate why don't you come on the podcast um because these sorts of conversations can help thousands of people so um yeah he's here today to have a chat to us about his journey where he's come from what he's been doing so you've on and off you're you've you've made about three and a half years through your carpentry apprenticeship Yeah, yeah So, mate, tell, without going into huge amounts of detail, because it'll come out through the, the conversation, but um, you obviously love the industry. Love it. Love and carpentry. And so, yeah, you started a carpentry apprenticeship, obviously, roughly three yep, and a half years ago. Yeah, three, three to three and a half years ago, yeah. And uh, I've worked for a few different builders, good builders, bad builders. I've had a pretty good track record with, with them. And about a month ago, ended it with my previous builder and then I took a step back and decided to say hey let's take the next few months to to find out what's out there find out what so it what, means what to made, be a builder. what made you pull the pin on your, your previous builder considering you're so close to finishing your time it's a bit of an interesting one it's a uh, they are a family friend first before they were my boss and there was a conflict uh of i feel we had conflicting morals on a on a situation that happened and instead of uh potentially uh ruining that friendship decided to to take a step back yeah and and move on and that was really amicable and and they're amazing i love them and uh still talk to them and, and still get advice from them and it's awesome yeah because I, I know the guys you're working for and they're, they're great guys so um yeah and they definitely do some good work so mm. but um like what was your story previous to that so you'd, you'd before that you'd work with a couple of different builders Dodge- yeah yes yeah. yeah so i uh, i started off i i started as a removalist picking up furniture and doing stuff and one day i was moving a man and he said hey i like your work ethic i like how you move you're a gun. I want you to come and work for me as an apprentice. Come, come make a career. Removals is not a career. And so I started on with him, and he was great. We we're doing some really, really awesome work, renovations and, and new builds, upper market stuff. Great. Um, and then I decided... So up, up until that point, did you yeah. ever consider the building industry? Like, what, Was it on your radar? <clears throat> to be honest, I did carpentry in school. Or rather, sorry, product design and technology. And I loved it. Loved working with my hands. Loved designing things. Obviously, that's a little bit more cabinet making and a little bit more different from just being a carpenter in the um, construction industry. Went through school, did that, and then spent six months after I finished school sitting around, not knowing what I wanted to do in life. So I figured what better way to grow up than move out of home and, and, and move in a state. I'm originally from Victoria, yeah. a little town called Ballarat, and I, I wanted to to kickstart my adult life by kicking myself out of the nest and moving up here with not a lot of plans and so you moved up here you got a job as a removalist yep that led to a, a carpentry apprentice um and then yeah that first guy didn't work out so you you left him and moved on to another yeah another builder um so what like i'm very curious because i <clears throat> I love to improve. I know there's definitely, like even in my own building business, um, mm. there's always massive room for improvement. Um, like myself, my team members, and especially with younger guys, like I do, 
feel for the younger guys sometimes. Um, like the older guys tend to give them a hard time, and um, especially when it comes to, I don't know. And look, I was the same for many, many years, and I, I pull my team up on it um, now regularly. Like you just expect people to know, and because you're under the pump on site, you're trying to get as much work as you can done for the mm. boss, and, and so you're putting more pressure on the on the younger guys, and um, it can be a like for for different types of people it can be a hard situation because yep. they don't like being driven all the time so I'm, I'm keen to hear from your point of view from a younger guy that's been an apprentice for a few years now with multiple different builders yeah. like what's the, so what's the main drivers behind leaving the other two builders was it a personality thing was it a work quality thing like so first builder um left so i was working for this first builder that that started my apprenticeship and he was great for all I knew. I was very green. I was very naive. I didn't know much. So I was like, I took a step back and I was like, maybe I'm in a bubble. Maybe I'm not. I don't know. So I had a friend, this family friend that uh, his father runs a, a, a carpentry, a, a build, he's a builder, he runs a business. And I said, hey, can I come work with you for a day, for a week, uh, just to, to gauge what else is out there and to make sure I'm not in this little bubble where I'm potentially working for a, a, a crappy builder. Uh, so is this the first yeah. builder? Because you've told us a bit of a story. Like, is, it the, is this first guy the guy that you like, were going back fixing things and you... Yes, like, yeah. So in the email I sent you, yeah, it's quite a funny story. He was keen. He was ambitious. He was a, little, a bit older. He was, he was late 30s, early 40s. And, yeah, he, he had a house that he bought. It was his house. And then we... Uh, an old Queenslander lifted it up, built it out. The block was only about eight to ten meters wide, and then it went back a couple of hundred meters. And yeah, we built it up, and it was cool. But in in some areas, he cut corners. In in this deck, he cut corners, and yeah, that made me take a step back and think, oh, is he a good builder? So you stood up to him on a certain occasion, didn't you, and told him a, if he did it right the first time, he wouldn't have to do it again. It's a, it's a funny story. Uh, a bit of context needed for that one. So we had finished this job. We'd moved on to the next job. And these pretty much what he, what he, how he did the deck was <clears throat> concrete, concrete risers, concrete steps, and then he just laid uh, bush batten or, or rough sawn down, screwed it into the concrete, and then we just laid our decking on that. Me being a so no no sort of damp proof membrane underneath I the battens. I think what we or... did was we put um, blackjack or what I forget what the actual technical name of it is. Uh, but bitumen paint. Like, yes, yeah. uh, we put that down. Uh, which at the time I was like, oh yeah, cool. But now I look back on that, and I'm like, uh, no, that's not how it's done. Yeah, probably not the best no. product for that scenario. Hundred percent not. So we we did that, put the decking boards down, and this was during the floods back in. And the heavy rain back in 2021, 2022, I forget which one. And um, they were wider decking boards, 120s, and they kept swelling and popping and kept popping the screws. And we kept going back. This whole build was nine months. Uh, and then we left, moved on to the next job, and we were going back every so month. Was it, so what hardwood decking, what, screwed into pine buttons? Into, it? yes, that was just screwed into the concrete floor. Yeah, and so the battens were popping off the concrete, were they? The um, it was, it was many reasons. The battens were popping off. The spacings for the decking boards was too close together. So when the heavy rains came and they swelled, they were pushing against each other and pushing them up and off. It was just just trash, and yeah, we kept it going like back. Yeah, sounds like there's a lot going on there. And so the the story is that. I was very green and naive. We were all there. This was the third time we went back and the foreman's there, the, the builder's there. And I was like, like, oh, if we'd just done this like properly from the start, wouldn't this have happened? Just said it, not even thinking about it. Um, and the look of pain on, on the builder's face when I said that coming from a first year, he knew he, he knew he stuffed up. He would have lost, he would have been losing thousands of dollars on that. It's kind of funny, but also kind of embarrassing. I was just green, and I, I opened my big mouth reality thinking about it, but he cupped it on the chin, and I think he, he recognised that he definitely cut some corners there. It's not, not to make any excuses, but there's a lot of 
builders out there and and trades that just they continue to do things the way that they've always been taught they don't put any time into education they look so many trades and builders don't even read the specification documents or product data sheets or any of that type of thing so they just they're doing things without knowing if it's right or wrong like they're just doing it because that's the way they've always been shown or taught or or yeah. how they think it's done so it's look it's it's good that you've had i guess the I don't know if you call it balls or whatever, but you've obviously made a call to move on to another builder after that um, to try and find someone that, who you thought was doing things the right way. Yeah, definitely. And they were, and they were incredible. Uh, they didn't just do carpentry. They did everything. And I'm so... A lot of people don't like that. A lot of people don't like picking up a shovel. A lot of people don't like picking up a paintbrush. They are so hyper-specialised that they... Oh, that's not my job. But I, I ate that up. Yeah. I think it's a great skill to have, to know how to concrete, to paint, to plaster, to to do all this stuff on top of carpentry, to do cabinetry, to yeah. to do all this stuff. Uh, and because of that, I was able to set up my, my little handyman gig that I do, and it's been a huge asset. Yeah. So don't, don't take this the wrong way, but look, so if you haven't finished your apprenticeship or you're not qualified, how are you running a handyman business? So um, QBCC Law is what is it if you're not if you don't have your cert three or you don't have a trade under your name you can't do any works over the price of 3.3 3, yeah i don't go anywhere near that i do handyman work so i wanted to do it properly a lot of people like it's awesome a lot of a lot of apprentices do cashies but i wanted to do it properly from the start to to gain that experience of yeah. how to do it properly so, I so, have. You, so you made the calls, you looked into it, so every, yeah. like you're doing it all above yeah. board. I kind of did a bit of a soft launch and it's still, you know, I'm doing handyman work here and there, but I, I'm not pushing into it as heavily as I could. Yeah, It's more just for fun, for experience, for learning how to talk with clients, learning how to do quotes, learning how to do this stuff. And yeah. I did it properly. I set up an ABN. I have insurance. I have pub, public liability. I, I, I have proper branding. I have contracts that i get clients to sign mate we need to get you on uh, my quotes quoting program yeah mate it'll sort you it's, out you'll smash out all your quotes all your handyman work in seconds definitely it's actually quite funny i just came across came across a limitation on the um the quoting app that i'm using at the moment um that is not able to be bypassed in the app so i'm actually currently looking mate, for a new app free trial we'll hook you up we'll train you it's all uh, awesome we'll get you on board yeah but um well, look, that, I think that's awesome that you've shown that ambition and you're, you're doing that. So where, where's the aspiration come from to be a builder? Like you've, you've been doing it a few years now. You obviously have got to develop a bit of a passion for it. Like is, it. is it the work that's driving you? Is it the possible um, financial outcome if you run a good business? Like what, what's driving you? For me, it's carpentry building. It's, it's not just a job. It's, it's a lifestyle and it's a, it's a passion. I love working with, with beautiful people building materials i love the the honor it is to to work with clients and you are it's awesome you are building their dreams you are making their dreams become a reality and what an what an awesome job that is what an honor it is to do that and i want to do that for clients and i want to do it well especially in an industry that's full of uh, there's a lot of good builders and then there's a lot of not good builders and the the passion, the drive that, that is what drives me to wanting to do this, to come on this podcast, to, to reach out to about seven different builders that I've worked for over the past yeah. month. It's definitely a shame. Look, our, our industry is full of incredible builders, incredible trades, but the reality is a lot of them are driven to do below par work because they have like if they, they've got to get in and out as quickly as possible to try and make a dollar out of it. 100%. No one. If, if only they put a little bit of time, energy and money into uh, developing their knowledge and their skills and their, their business and their mindset and all those types of things and realise that it's not all about the bottom yeah. line and the, the price. Um, and the other big driver for our industry is it's driven by volume builders. So in the volume building market, it's not, hey, here's a, we got this job coming up um, to go out to all their subbies. Can you give us some pricing on all this? It's like, hey, 
here's 50 homes. Yeah. We're paying you $16 a linear yeah. metre to throw up wall frames. We're paying you... Sixteen dollars a square meter paint it like you, we're paying you thirty dollars a square meter to lay tiles. Like they set the rate, so uh, when it, yeah. any tilers, plumbers, concreters, who, whoever it may be that get tied up in that work, and don't get me wrong, there's plenty of tradies out there making a shitload of money yep. doing work for volume builders, but they are running around like everyone that works for them is running around. Like it, it's all just get in, get out, yeah, like, I, and I a lot of the time. Yeah. The next trade's covering up shit work by the previous trade and the first time it becomes apparent is when the homeowner's moved in and there's an issue with something. Yeah. So I, I had the, um, <clears throat> the opportunity to work for a volume builder. Um, Corey, Corey from Ideal, awesome guy. Contacted him, uh, did a little bit of work. He's been on your podcast. He, he's great. What his, what his crew does is amazing. And that was my first experience being on he does the carpentry work he's, yes, he's not a yes. volume builder yeah um so i worked with them for a week and it was awesome it was again trying to gain as much experience of how the industry works especially when you're in that little bubble you're doing renos you're just tinkering away on a, a little queenslander it was awesome being on that volume site but yeah definitely was sad seeing some of the other mobs and how they just cut corners and it just broke my heart because <laughs> This this isn't a job. This is a passion. I love doing thing. I love doing carpentry, and I love doing it right. Yeah. And yeah, there's a lot of corners cut because all they care about is money. And I have a strong belief that you can run a successful business without having to cut corners, and you can without having to take advantage of the clients not knowing any better. Uh, Oh, mate, you don't have to cut corners. I, I ran a very, very successful subcontract carpentry business for years and years. And uh, there was a lot of bills that I worked for that were paying me far more than they were paying other gangs that worked for them. Mm. And that was because of they appreciated my skills, my organisation, my leadership. And, and they just knew if I come on their sites and I, we smashed out the work that it would be... It actually saved them money because their supervisors didn't have to check our stuff. Yeah. Like they just knew that if... DPS Constructions was on the job, then yep. the supervision was spot on. The, um, and look, it, that's the whole reason that we're doing this podcast, like to level up the industry, like lift the game um, for everyone involved. But like, what's your plans moving forward? Like, how are you going to upskill yourself to become a builder? That's that's what this is all about. I've I've taken my, I've taken until the end of the year. I've set myself a goal, and the goal is I'm not a builder now. I'm an apprentice. I'm going to finish my apprenticeship. But what can I start doing now to set myself up to become an excellent builder? So what, what are you doing? <sighs> a lot. Focusing on the business, learning how to talk with clients, learning how to do quoting. Because So pretty much I hear all these stories. I hear all these stories of these builders that were chippies and then they just become builders and the cert for and it doesn't teach you how to run a business. It doesn't teach you how to do all of that. And and hearing all these mistakes, misquoting, and and just things that they've done wrong. But what, have, what but what are you doing to like? Are you doing programs? You're doing courses. You got mentors. I've signed up for my cert four, and I'm trying to took some time to decide whether I wanted to do the diploma or the cert four. I've now decided to do the cert four, a little bit more easier and 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 practical practical for what I want to do. I'm. What's, what's the differences in them? I haven't done that. I haven't done that sort of thing, mate, for well, 27 years. Well, of that well that's why I came. I, I've been in contact with all these builders, people like you coming on this podcast. Is because there's not a lot of info online, and I'm trying to discover that. And 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 I'm sure there's a lot of other blokes out there that have a lot of questions. Pretty much, the cert four is single story, uh, new builds, and your diploma. In, this is so. This is the cert for in building and construction, and the diploma of building and construction. The diploma allows you to go three stories up, and unlimited outwards. So you can do townhouses that are all connected, and it, it more focuses on the fire safety aspect. The diploma is pretty much the cert for. It has all of the cert for units, and then there's just a couple of other units on top of it. But is this? Are you talking about this is to get your builder's license or yes. to? So I am because builder's license is. You generally get, like in Queensland here anyway, you get low rise, medium rise, and yep. open. Yeah. So, so to get your low rise, you have to do your cert four, 
And then if you want to go get your medium rise, you have to do your diploma to get yep. the license. The cert for doesn't give you the license. It, it, it meets the prerequisite to go and try and obtain the license. You have to do your cert for, and then you have to have two years as like a registered site supervisor, not just a head foreman. They've cracked down on that. Yeah, um, so I, I did all um, – it was, it was called something different, but about uh, six or seven years ago I did – everything to get my open builders license mm. and i passed everything like paid the money did all the courses over about 18 months two years and i was completely devastated at the end because i got to the end and they're like oh it's awesome mate you've passed everything well done ticked all the boxes now you need to go and work for a open builder for two years but you're not a builder yeah and i'm like fuck that why would i shut a great profitable successful building business down to go and work for another builder for two years Hundred percent. So, look, I, I don't. And look, I only did it to tick the box. Like, just to, for me, it was just another thing to say I've gained that knowledge. I've mm. got that experience. I, I can tick a box to say I've got my open builders license. But I never had any intentions of yeah. building high rises or buildings that required an open builders license. But yeah. Um, but what about like actual skills? So you're doing that to get your. Uh, I was going to say business side of things, but it's not even really business side of things. Like you're doing that to to grow your knowledge and get a certificate what are you actually doing to further your skills and become the builder that you seem so passionate about trying to level up i'm, I'm on the hunt for a good builder that yeah. can teach me and 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 grow me and actually wants to invest in me to then m- make me a builder because i'm keen i'm keen to deep dive so don't think yeah. i'm picking no, on no. you or giving go for a crack it. at you but go for it because i think this sort of conversation will help a lot of builders but also a lot of young people that are either thinking about getting in the industry or maybe having a hard time in their apprenticeship or whatever at the moment but so you're sitting there saying you you want to find a good builder like what is a good builder to you so i initially started my goal as saying i'm trying to find the perfect builder and then i quickly realized that's that's not realistic that's not how it works no one is perfect but there's a very clear difference in the industry because there's a lot of good builders and there's a lot of bad builders. I'm trying to find the right fit. I'm, I'm ambitious, I'm keen, and I'm trying to find a builder that, that does the work that I want to do and, and, and invests in his boys, cares more about not just the business but the boys. If you, if you have a happy crew, you're going to have a happy business. So how – I love this because it's very – it's interesting here in different points of views about it. So, like, so yeah, so you want to find a good builder – so I'm hearing you want a builder that has good culture in their team, yeah. um, has good values, that invest time and money into helping you team grow. Is mm-hmm. that correct? Yeah. I'm assuming you want a builder that does things to code and quality work. 100%. Um, provides a good work environment. Yeah. Um, because one of the hardest things for, like, and I'm sure a lot of business owners will agree with you out there, one of the hardest things for me as a business owner is keeping a team that gels. Yeah. It's hard, man. It's not like a game of football where like you're side by side and working with each other for 80 minutes. Hmm. Like literally day in, day out, you're over the top of each other. You're helping each other out. Like yeah. the way that I explain it all the time, it's not like a – you can have a company that has 400 employees – and they all sit in their little cubicles and they mm. do a little thing and they have a little chat at Smoko. Yeah. Like trades are physically working side totally by different. side. You're smelling each other. You're getting sweat. Sweat your lives are into, like, yeah. dripped on you. So it is, as an employee, it is keeping the, the team motivated, working together, mm. communicating clearly together, getting on because everyone's got different opinions different beliefs different yeah. cultures like all that stuff um but like i hear where, i hear where you come from the about finding the good builder but like for, for me as an employee what are you going like if let's say i was that good builder so i tick all the boxes and you want to work for me mm. what are you going to do for me so that's the thing i got to clarify too what I, when i say all this i'm looking for the best builder i don't mean to come off as as cocky and arrogant no, no, is it, yeah, yeah. Is I, it wrong for me to want to work for a good builder? No, it's yeah, one hundred percent. I I love it. Yeah, I'm super keen to hear 
what are you going to do for that good builder? That's the thing. So if you want, yes. to, if you want a builder that's going to do all this for you, what are you going to do for him or her? Bring value to the business. Yeah. 100%. That's all it's about is it's the little things. As an apprentice, it's just rocking up on time, showing interest, asking questions, not just being a robot that gets t- – there's definitely a time and a place to be a robot and just do what you're told. But, but showing a keen interest and showing a willingness to learn, bringing what I have to the table – bringing the, the, the few but varied skills that I, I have. The fact that I came to, I was working with one builder and they, they were all chippies and we damaged an existing part of the house, just the wall. We put a hole in the wall. He's like, oh, how, how, how are we going to fix this? I'm going to have to get the plaster in. They've already been and gone. And I was like, oh, no, I know how to plaster. I can just do that. I'm a handyman. I can do little jobs like that. So f- personally for me, what I see, what I bring is just the different skill sets that I have and trying to, to fit that into what the builder needs and wants because it's not about me. It's about what the builder needs. Yeah. I heard, um, I heard this really explained really well in one of the Audible books I've been listening to lately and it look, it's never going to happen but it was a, a story about um, a very ambitious young person wanting to get into a job and he basically was putting himself out there and going to companies and saying, like, I will work for you for free. Like, you're a great company. I love what you do. Like, I just want to work with you. I'll do it for nothing. And he thought by saying that and doing that that he was providing incredible value. But from an employee, employer's point of view, it, it's not free because someone's got to put a shitload of time and effort into to training you yeah. to become the <clears throat> like to learn the skills that it takes to do that job. So, like this sort of stuff really does. Um, I don't know. Very, it interests me now because, like I said before, like you get the tradies on site that are just head down, bum up because the the boss or the whoever is above them is wanting so much work done. So they feel they don't have the time to slow down and put the time into showing an apprentice how to do something or or even another tradie for that matter so yeah it's 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 finding that compromise between how how do you work together how do you add value how do you um i guess grow your knowledge and skills when the people on site aren't necessarily taking the time to probably train you as good as mm. they should. Like I try and really drum it into my team now. Like one of my, my favorite sayings at the moment is you, you have to slow down to go forward. So you can't just, we can't just be head down bum up all the time. So if we want to train younger guys better and get them to the level that we need them to be, Yes, things are going to slow down and yes, things are going to cost me more money, but we've got to put the time into them. So for you as a young fella, like how would you approach that on site? Or how would you, like if you were in that situation, like how would you approach the, the carpenters or the lead carpenters or supervisor or the, or the boss of the company to say, hey, look, I'm not learning anything. I, I'm, everything's too quick. No one's taking the time to actually show me stuff. Like how would you approach all that? Well, I think... It- it's the role of the, the carpenters to teach you, definitely. But you have to take control of your own learning. We'll be back after a quick break. If you're in the market for some top quality meat, then check out Farmer to Fridge and help local farmers in your area get a fair price on their produce while stocking your freezer with the best cuts you can buy. Farmer to Fridge is an online marketplace directly connecting local farmers with local consumers for all your favourite cuts of beef, lamb, chicken and pork. So Google the words halfacow.farmer and jump on the website to order your meat now. Because a lot yeah. of people aren't, people are trades, they're not taught to be teachers. They're not taught to be teachers, yep. Asking questions, just, you can never ask too many questions, it's such a simple thing ask instead of just being the robot and just do it watching them and then doing it say hey why do you do it that way why have you done it that way have you done it differently in the past what's the benefits of doing it like that what are the disadvantages so how would you handle someone that doesn't like a hundred questions 
this is going to sound a bit obnoxious and controversial, controversial, but I wouldn't work for them. That's why I'm taking the time to, to find a builder that fits me. Yeah. And I, I've stressed, I, it comes off as, as cocky, but it comes from a, a place where I want to find a company long-term. So if someone's, like I'm on my, my younger guys' backs all the time, like um, even when, when I was an apprentice, like my boss used to call them storybooks and then I, when I started my time, I called them storybooks and in my, when I was doing my apprenticeship, I was going to say back in my day, I'm not that old, but <laughs> um, mate, our nail bags were filled with storybooks and those storybooks were offcuts of ply, plasterboard, 30, 70 by 35, whatever it was, but you had storybooks on you. Now uh, with my team, they have to have notebooks on them. Yeah, I carry so one on me all the time. Yeah, if you're getting told to do something, like you're taking notes, you're writing things down. like 100%. I, yeah. I have notes for, for cut lists and then I have my to-do list on my phone. Um, at the start of the day when we're going through with with the, the, the builder and the head chippy or the foreman, it's not just their job to plan out the day. It is their job, but take control. That's what I do. I'm there, they're, they're taking their notes for the day and I'm there taking my notes as well. Coming yeah. up with a list of things that I need to do for the day, what I can do for the carpenter, what I can get him, all of these things. I'm a big fan of having, you, you need to have a target. So every morning having a toolbox meeting, might be five, 10 minutes, mm. but just especially for younger people, like every single morning, whatever carpenters are on that site, whether it's two, three, five, 10, doesn't matter, have a quick chat, all right, guys, this is where we got to yesterday. By the end of today, I want to be here. Mm. And like planning the day so yeah. that even as a young carpenter or apprentice that may not have all the skills to do what's getting done, you have focus for the day. Mm. And I believe that by doing that, by the, by the lead carpenters or tradesmen on site doing that, I hope that it gives younger guys like yourself uh, I guess the skills to be asking like, all right, well, what, what do I, what do you want me to do next? Uh, like if, if they're, if you're finishing up one area, like what, can I set up something over there? Mm. Like what's, what's coming up next? Can I get some timber ready? Can I get, can I move the scaffold? Can I move the saw bench? Like what? Well, the, well, when you go through with the to-do list at the start of the day, I don't have to then ask them what's on next. I can go and get it set up. I don't have to go up and say, Hey, I just, I've just finished lay, nailing this off. Like what, what do you want me to do next? I go up and say, hey, I've just finished nailing this off. I'm about to go start doing this. Is it okay? Is yeah. that something else you'd rather me do? Yeah. And that's brilliant because a lot of guys out there are just going from one thing to the next. Like, yeah. all right, what do you want me to do now? Done that. Back again. All right, what do you want me to do now? Yeah, you gotta, right. It's a bigger picture. Yeah. And you gotta, you got to take control of it. You, you, <sighs> yeah, look, it's, it's definitely a... Look, I hope this conversation is opening up a can of worms for people that are listening because... Like it is, there's so much going on here. Like you literally have, you have tradies or people that are living their own little lives and they're, they're a particular type of person. And mm. like I said before, like a lot of tradies just want to do their job. Yeah. They don't want to hold people's hands and they're not taught how to be teachers and all that type of stuff. And then you've got younger generation coming through that are too busy thinking about the next opportunity they're going to get to look at social media on their phone. Yeah. So they're getting told, like, and this is, this is the biggest frustration for myself, for my, for everybody in my team is, okay, so you asked what to do next or what's happening or what's going on today. We take the time to explain it. You take your notes in your book, but it's gone straight in one ear and out the other. And 10 minutes after the meeting, you're still, you're asking again, all right, what are we doing now? Hmm. So like, I don't know, like attention spans don't seem to be what they used to or is it because of the way that it gets explained to you? Like what do you think happens in those situations? Hmm. I find for me what works best is when you, I'm a bit better now, but when you're 19, 16, you can be an apprentice. It's scary having to do stuff. These big burly men telling you what to do, but, and it, it, it causes, you, causes you to want to rush through it and do it. And you got to train yourself to be like, take the time. Okay, look, I'm not doing it as quickly as the carpenters are. But what's better if I half ass it and rush through it and go and do it and then go up to them and say, hey, I've done this, but it's all wrong. 
or taking a step back and saying, okay, oh, how did he want me to do this? Just a little bit of critical thinking. Yeah. Do you think the 1% is important? The 1%, can you explain that to me? Sorry. Mate, I'm just a massive fan. A lot of my teams are a big fan. Like just, uh, you, yeah, sorry. Like just whatever you're told to do, you just you always go that, that extra 1%, that extra little bit, yeah. that extra little detail, that a little bit of extra effort. Like just just impress. I, I like do don't that. Just do I, it to the bare minimum. Do it to impress everything. Every single thing you do, do it to impress. I'm, I'm probably for a lot of the carpenters I've worked with and for, I'm almost annoying in that aspect. I'm constantly asking too many questions. <laughs> There's a time and a place to put your head down and do your work. You definitely got to earn your stripes, but I'm asking so many questions and I'm trying to, to find these little one percents that I can do better. What can I do for him now? What can I do better? Hey, last week, how did I go? What can I do better this week? All these little things that I'm trying to just chip away at so that by the time I'm qualified, I'm a good carpenter. Like from an employee, like every, every trade I know, every builder I know could employ more people tomorrow. Mm. But, and that's, that's just reality. That's not exaggerating. Mm. But trying to find the right apprentice, the right carpenter, the right labourer is super difficult because it's, it's like everyone's wanting, like no one wants to, like when I did my apprenticeship uh, and a lot of people my age I'm sure will agree, like like I knew what I wanted to be so that part of it was easy but like every single day I woke up and I rocked up to the work, I was there to impress and I busted my balls to get everything done as quick as I probably possibly could as good as I could for the skills mm. that I had at the time but just every single day and mate I got screamed at I got shit thrown at me uh, my boss used to call me young and like all I heard all day was fucking young and where are you like I'm waiting like if I'm standing around yep. I'm losing money like what the fuck are you doing like every yeah. day and so I went through two bosses during my apprenticeship. I didn't finish. I only did three and a half years, um, but I haven't had enough skills and my, my last boss was good enough to sign me off. Yeah. But um, so look, and so I don't, they're very few and far between. Like, you know, like we've put, I couldn't even tell you off the top of my head how many apprentices we've put through now in the last 20 years, but um, or 18 years, it had, it's definitely a lot but they're few and far between like the ones that just want to try hard and impress every single day mm. and I feel bad because uh, like I think back now and think I'm sure a lot of the kids that we've put through that dropped off would have actually been really good trades mm. but is it the way that I've treated them is it the way my team's treated them could we have done things better so that's why I'm really keen on these conversations yeah. now because i I do feel there's got to be a better way. Like it can't just be, we all just can't be out there saying that, oh, just, there's no good kids coming through anymore. Like everyone's lazy. Like there, no there one is. wants to, like everyone yeah. just wants the most money and doesn't want to do the, the work to get it and all that. Like, so there's got to be a lot of conversations had mm. around these topics because I'm sure there's a lot of young people out there that will become great tradies yeah. and great builders if they're given the right opportunity. Yeah. So it takes two. It takes an apprentice that's keen and willing to put in and a builder that's also willing to, to put in as well. And if you have those two combinations right, you'll, you'll grow this young apprentice to becoming a great chippy and potentially one day a great builder. Well, it's way more than that. Like you, so, can't, yeah. you can't just be keen. Yeah. Like, you've, like uh, something that I've learned now, like you've you've got to it's you've got to have the right attitude. Yeah. You've got to have the right mindset. You've got to you've got to be calm. You've got to you've got to understand that yes, there's going to be things that are going to be done. Yeah. Multiple times, there's going to be mistakes. It's yeah. going to cost a bit of money along the way. You can um, teach skills, but you can't teach character. You can't teach ambition. So, oh, mate, character is the biggest thing now. Like mm. I, I can teach someone, or my team can teach someone skills, but we can't attitude is the most important thing 100% um, and you, yeah that's I don't know that's we would go all day we could definitely open a can of worms on that I'm, yeah. I'm pretty old school when it comes to that side of things like um, I do believe the world's very privileged now 
everyone wants everything straight away and doesn't want to do the hard yards to yeah. get it. So It's a long game. There, yeah. A lot of people are just looking at the short game. We still haven't figured out how you're getting from where you are now to being a builder. So like, hit, hit me with questions. What do you got? I'm still figuring it out. So pretty much some questions I have for you is, and these are earnest questions. I want your advice for me personally and for other people that might be on this journey as well. What are some of the avenues I can, I can take? I'm doing my cert for, I'm going to, the, I'm, I'm, I'm contacting all these different builders, getting different bits of advice and tips from them coaching programs i'm an apprentice i can't afford to to join hia with their however many thousands of dollars it is a, a year to join them what are the avenues that that someone like me who is keen and ambitious can can do to become a better chippy for a builder oh, mate, i don't i don't think there's any excuses these days like there is so much free mm-hmm. information out there mm-hmm. and Look, there is plenty of incredible trades on Instagram, for example, that are sharing incredible content. There's heaps, yeah. Um, YouTube, mate, there is some incredible trades and builders on there that are putting amazing knowledge and skills out there for you to watch and learn from. Um, Something often that you have said, though, in the past is you have to pay your to pay to put into yourself to you've got to spend money on yourself mate. that's it yeah so the the quicker you can learn to spend like i wish i had to start spending time money and energy on myself in my early 20s not in my mid 30s hmm. um and so there's all levels mate like see, honestly there is no excuses like i i do lots of online stuff now with mentors europe Mm. states um i generally like these days i pay for the higher level ones but mate a lot of the online stuff with billionaires or experts in marketing Mm. or experts in business experts in finances mate you can get a ticket to most online events for 99 dollars. yeah so there is no excuses but if you can't come up with 99 dollars to spend on yourself to boost your knowledge and your um yeah like just your the information that you can get put in front of you like to, like i said like to me these days it's all excuses like there is always a way to yeah. get and books in, and podcasts there's so much information mate, books out and there podcasts. And like books and podcasts have, well more so audible books have changed my mm. life i've learned just as much from listening so mate audible books what what is it 14.95 a month or something mm. I've learned just as much, if not more, from Audible books over the last five or six years than the hundreds of thousands of dollars that I've spent with coaches, mentors mm-hmm. and programs in the last probably four or five years. So, and look, yes, it's definitely worth paying the bigger money when you get to that level that you can with these programs because for me, like... The program itself, like whether you pay ninety nine dollars or twelve thousand dollars, mm. you're getting the exact same information. The difference is that generally after the event, it's the connections and it's the networking. Yeah. Um, that's and that, again, that's just you pay the bigger money because the knowledge and the mm. the relationships and the um, networking yeah. that you get out of that is worth every single cent but like i said the 99 dollar jump in get the recording of the zoom like jump on get to get to join it on zoom or whatever Mm. mate just jump on board take notes no i've 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 bought a lot of books i've listened to a lot of podcasts i've signed up to go to a couple of the um master builder sessions and there's plenty out there 100 my biggest thing now mate if if i could go back if someone asked me what advice I would give to a 20 year old Dwayne um I can tell you straight away it's going to be put in that extra one percent every single day like so I'll list the day out for you you get up early you get energized you show up early like don't show up like on time's late no like especially when it comes to tradies 100 you should be on site before the tradies if you're working with other tradies with other builders and you're an apprentice, you're a labourer, you're a young guy that's wanting to learn, 
you should be on site before anybody else. You're there with your tools out already to then help the tradies take their tools out. That's what I've always mate. tried to do. You should be turning up, showing... Like, 100%. That shows you're keen. It shows you're enthusiastic. It shows you're motivated. You should be there unlocking the gate so that when the tradies turn Definitely. up, they back their trailer in or back their ute in. Soon as before they've even... Mate, before my boss had even turned his engine off... I was unloading gear out of the back of the year. Yeah. I wasn't waiting for him to tell me every day, oh, we're doing this today. We need that. We need that. You should know. Like, it's again that touch on that being a robot versus yeah. having a bit, little bit of critical thinking. Yep. So wake up early, show up before everybody else. Mate, if there's nothing to get ready, grab a fucking broom and start cleaning, the sweeping the job yeah. out or cleaning the site. There's always something. Well, there's not nothing to do. There's always something to do. There is always something to do. And then when it comes to the actual work, mate, like just communication like i'm like i said i feel for a lot of younger guys that i've put through their time because i was going down the track like i was taught i'd yell and scream and yeah. kick people in the ass and like it's not the right way so um and look i've still got a lot of room to improve on it but i'm i'm really big on communication like and if i think back now that would be my advice to the 20 year old me like don't just yell and scream at people mm. um like take the time to figure out the type of person they are, the personality, figure out what type of person, how they learn. Like, do I need to draw them pictures or point yeah. things out to them more? Like, um, because I know for me, I'm a very, the way I learn is by writing things down, taking notes, yeah. scribbling things on pieces of paper. Yeah. So everyone's different and you gotta, you gotta adjust the way that you approach people differently to, to how they are and who they are yeah my biggest mistake mate with not just younger guys but anyone that worked in my business for a long time was i was trying to make them me like mm. i i could smash it out i could do this i could do that and i was always angry because i was like why the fuck can't you do that like yeah, why i would have done, how, I, how done I can it. do it in this amount of time and it's taking you that amount yeah. of time like everybody's different um so yeah figuring that out but yeah show up early put in the effort show you're keen ask questions the one percent like honestly it's that one percent and that one yeah. percent needs to flow through not just younger people but the entire industry and uh, look this will definitely stir things up but i can't what's it been now running my own business 20 odd years i've only had a couple of dozen times where people that work for me have given me a christmas gift like mm. people, people think this doesn't mean much, but to me, it's, this is super yeah. important. I don't believe employees should give Christmas gifts. We, we always do it. We do it most of the time. We give bonuses and things, but mm. I don't believe we should. I, it should be the other way around. Mm. Like people should appreciate that they like... You're employed. Someone is employed. They've got a job. They're getting paid every week. Like Especially if they're good and they're feeding into so, you. Doesn't have to be huge. Give your boss a ten dollars scratchy at Christmas time. Give it. Give the boss a scratchy on his birthday. Like show the company you work for that yeah. you appreciate I, I, having a yeah. job. I've done that with my previous boss. He was doing a little job on on his house, where you had another job going on, and I said, "Hey, like you're doing the sheeting. Like I will come in on the weekend and I'll help you sheet. Thanks, thanks for the job that you've given me. Thank you for the opportunities you've given me, the skills yeah. that you've taught me. One hundred percent, like." It's a it's very no, different. It's a very different world, mate. Like, and look, I'm not saying it to be a dick. Like, I, my boss was renovating his house. Like, I used to same as you just said. Like, I would literally go, "All right, mate, what's going on over the weekend? Working on your house? Oh, yeah, sweet. What what time tomorrow? I got nothing on. I'll come and help you." It's no just pay. decency, yeah. For me, it was just I was furthering my skills. I was getting more knowledge. Like, because it was more time on the tools. It was it's, more time yeah. doing work. It's not that hard. There's so many. Like, just put a little bit of effort in. Mm. It, there's so many people that just put in 90%. Just put some blimmin' effort in. Yeah, mate, getting, getting ahead in life, getting the job you want, having the financial situation you want is, is really not that difficult. It's not. It's just people aren't prepared to put in that extra 1%. Yeah, and to have integrity and to work hard, and it's, it's not that hard. Yeah. So what, what else you got for me, mate? What other, uh, you come here for advice? What do you want... <laughs> One thing I wanted to touch on was 
obviously I'm doing my handyman work. I'm, I'm doing weekend work with, with block layers. I'm doing weekend work with all, the, all these other different trades, trying to pick up little bits of the different skills. So you're doing that for free? Um, no, so I've, I've <laughs> <laughs> no, so no, well, I've, I've told a, a few of the other trades I've met on site. I said, Hey, uh, let me know if you ever need an extra set of hands on the weekend, here's my number. Please call me. I'd love to learn how to, to lay blocks. How I'd love to learn how to do polished concrete, how to, to do all of this. And what the question I had was, What's your take on everyone specialized these days? Everyone's so hyper specialized in doing different aspects of carpentry. Some carpentry mods only do cladding and some only do this and some only do that. And that's great. And there's definitely a market for that. But I think Again, that's driven. It's driven by the volume builders, mate. Like they get a carpenter gang into the frame. They get a gang into do windows and suites <laughs> and cladding. They get a gang into do the internal fit off. They but people, people are so afraid to just go out of their bubble to pick up a shovel or to, to do this, like we had some, some concrete bags delivered the other week and the truck driver was like, oh yeah, you guys need to take them off the truck. We don't, company policy, we don't, we don't take them off the truck. What? Just, just put some work in, put some effort in. It's everyone just wants to do their own little thing and they don't want to broaden their skill set. They don't want to pick up a shovel. They don't want to do... A little bit of painting, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Yeah, look, I think it depends on, well, it depends on who you're working for. Yeah. The, and look, yeah. not making an excuse for that truck driver, but mate, all that sort of thing is driven by laws and people suing and all mm -hmm. that type of rubbish. 100%. And it's... And that, I realise that, and I understand that it's, it's multifaceted in that way. But yeah, I'm, look, I'm a, definitely a fan of the more skills you can have, the better. Like on, in my business, our boys have a crack at everything. We do concreting, do roofing. Yeah, um, awesome. We've never really done much tiling. Over the years, we've done a little bit of plastering. But again, you've got to look at it at both sides. Like, I think that's fantastic. Mm. And I love that I've got an incredibly skillful team. I love that myself and my supervisor and my lead carpenters have so, a lot of experience. But there's people out there that don't want to do all that. Yeah. There's people out there that just want to job. go and work for a builder and turn up every single day and do all the carpentry. And, get, and just get paid. And look, there's definitely a lot of people out there. When it, so these days you've got... So carpentry, these days, you can do a full apprenticeship doing frames, cladding, fit-outs, mm. and you get a carpentry licence. And you, like I, I, I believe you're not a carpenter. Yeah. And we've employed carpenters that have come to me for a carpentry job and haven't told me, like I've asked them all the questions, they've told me they can do everything, put them on a fit out and they're 30 years old and they can't mm. hang a door. Yeah, they're quick at putting up frames, yeah. they're quick at yeah. cutting and doing all but that. But then you've yeah. also got plastering. Like plastering these days you can get a sheeting team, a setting team, a cornice team, a sanding team. So you've got plasterers out there that aren't fully qualified as a plasterer that can do everything. Mm. So it's just the way the industry is going because... And again, it's a lot of it's driven by volume builders with tight schedules and just get in yeah. and get out and everyone's on a, in a rush. But I think it's very important to be skilled or at least have a little bit of knowledge about everything, especially if you want to become a builder. I feel exactly the same. And that's why I'm doing the handyman business and trying to, trying to pick up a little bit of everything. As a builder, you need to know how blocks work. You need to know how tiling works. Not to the full extent that the trades do, but you need to have a clue. And these chippies that just go come through and work for um, framing mobs, and then you can go and become a builder after that, after you do your set four. Like, they shouldn't be builders. You need to have an idea about all the other trades and how it works. Yeah, well, and you need to make sure you employ trades that are as passionate about what they do as what you are about, mm. as you do. Like, there's... We've employed carpenter gangs over the years, mate, that have, like, I've done all, I've tried to do my homework, I've asked all the questions, they've fit the bill, so we've mm. given them work to do. They've, um, like, one guy in particular had quite a large team come in, threw a frame up, it was rough as guts, and then cracked the shits because I wouldn't pay him his last draw that he mm. put in, and 
yeah, argued for a week or two, um, gave him plenty of opportunity to come back and get it. It, it. This wasn't even to my standard. This was to pass the engineer's inspection. Yeah. And he didn't want to do it. So um, it ended, that particular job ended up taking nine of my carpenters two weeks to Jeez. get that frame up to our standard, but mm. also to pass frame inspection. So, and that particular person out there now on social media is running massive carpenter gangs, doing his own speckies, like all types of stuff. So look, hopefully since he did that, that was, I don't know, maybe nine years ago, hopefully he's upped his skills and he's running a better business than he was back then. But is it, if, is it scary, like as a builder, having to, like obviously you've been building for many years. Have you got your trades pretty fine-tuned? You have your guys that you go to that you can trust? Oh, look, definitely we've got fantastic trades. But the reality is, mate, the... Well, especially now, like the building code is having the biggest changes it's had yeah. in, oh, I forget what it is, 20 or even 30 yeah, years. Yeah, I think it was like 20 years. So unless you're out there, unless my trades, and I know a few of them are, but like unless my waterproofer or my tiler or my window company or my the designers and architects that I work with, mm. the certifiers I work with, unless they're all out there going to these seminars and reading all the emails that we're getting sent from our licensing bodies and upskilling themselves to like i need to be over this shit yeah like, i can't just rely on trades like i can't rely on a building designer well the ones we work with i can but i still like to have my knowledge around it mm. but yeah i i think builders are bad for that they they rely too much on the people they're employing to do the work mm and then crack the shits when something's wrong or not right. Supervision to me is the number one most important thing to having a successful building business. Yeah. And it's probably another thing that gets overlooked by clients. Like, um, again, volume builders, I believe, have nowhere near enough supervision because they, like, they might have one supervisor looking after 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 jobs. Yeah. It is impossible for one supervisor when you take all the driving time in between. Like for us, like myself and my supervisor, like we only have, last year we got up to a point where I think we had nine jobs on at once at all different stages and sizes. And like, mate, that was hard mm. for the two of us to stay on top of everything. Like supervision, like as a builder, I think it's definitely something that a lot of builders overlook and don't allow enough time. Um, and a lot of builders sort of get to a point where they just think, oh, yeah, I can sit back in the office and run everything mm. from here. But supervision is the absolute key to mm. having a business that provides your clients the quality that they, sh they deserve to be getting. Do you feel like there should be more accountability for the other trades? 100%. Because it always comes back to the builder. Yep. Which doesn't seem fair. Yeah. No, trades, 100%, mate. But our licensing bodies, they tried that for a little while and then they went back to the way it is now because it's too many people to try and yeah. chase. The waterproofing but, fails, it's it's not the waterproofers, it's the builder's fault. Yeah, but again, look, I, I don't mind it the way it is. Like, if I want to be a builder and I want to charge what I need to charge to run a sustainable, successful, profitable building business, then it is my responsibility to make sure that every single material mm. is fit for purpose, that every trade does what they're meant to do, that my sites are safe and secure. Like for me, it's, 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 it's simple as that. Like yeah. I am the builder, I am the principal contractor. Everything is my responsibility. I don't point the finger at anybody. That's good. I think a lot of builders need to hear that and actually do that. There's a lot of builders that don't take responsibility. Well, look, I've learned a lot of expensive lessons, mate. It hasn't always been that way, mm. but these days it's black and white. Contract says that me, myself as a principal contractor is responsible for every single thing mm. that happens on a job site. Even if the owner's supplied something or the owner's engaged another contractor, it is my responsibility to make sure that that contractor does things as per building code mm. or as per specifications a builder just can't throw his hands in there and say oh look that's not my problem the, the client engage that contractor it's black and white 
The builder as the principal contractor is responsible for everything that happens on a building site. Black and white. 100%. Do you still want to be a builder? <laughs> That's the thing. I look at, I, I have the ambition and, and the drive to want to be a builder, but then I look at all these builders and I'm like, nah, it seems too stressful. That's why I'm taking the time now to try and set myself up so I can hopefully bypass some of those mistakes that a lot of builders make. Yeah, look, we, mate, look, you might live like build business. Like we, we have so many uh, members now signing up to that. Mm that can see what we're doing and they've worked for builders that are running a shit show and they've just seen for their whole apprenticeship that they've the builders been pulling their hair out and whinging about everyone and having all these issues mm. so mate we've got so many we've got guys that are supervising for builders that are trying to get their builders license mm. we've got guys that are um carpenters that want to become builders we've even got guys that haven't even finished their apprenticeship yet and so actually going back to you saying that they're thousands of dollars you can't afford things mate we've got guys that are apprentices that are fourth year apprentices know that they want to a part of live life yeah that want to get they know they want to become a builder Mm. they hear they've heard all the shit stories they've worked for people that have been running terrible businesses and they want to put themselves on the front foot and just hit the ground running. Well, that's why I came here so to ask you about, like, how, what, what can you do? Yeah, as an apprentice yeah, so to set yourself up. Yeah, and look, it, it's a lot of money. They're investing in themselves. Um, but look, t- for me, look, I'm, it's easy for me to sit here and say it's easy. But for me, I would, me personally, and I've done this through a lot of time in my life, I would rather drive a $2,000 ship box car and put all the money into the tools that I need to do my trade, the courses I need to do to yeah. get to where I want to get to um, rather than, and look, I like you hear this story all the time. Like I, I'm quite happy to not go on holidays or not be out three times a week with my friends eating out or going to the movies yeah. or like you can still have a good life yeah. for not a lot of money. But your career, you might as well invest in it if you're going to be doing Investing it for the rest of your life. and invest it. Like, and don't even get me started on the cars that some of these apprentices are driving when they're throwing all their money at those. I, I, well, mate, this is the thing. Like everybody, there's two things that people tell me all the time now because they see what I'm doing. They see all these businesses I got and that I'm teaching other builders how to do things. Mm. Um, and two things that I get told constantly. Number one is I don't have enough time. Number two is I can't afford it. Mm. I use those same two excuses for a long, long time. And I'm quite happy to sit here now and tell everybody that that's all they are. They're excuses. If excuses you want sound best you make to those that make them. Yeah. If you want something, you find the money. Sell something. Like don't drive around. Like some of these people that are telling me this are driving around in a... The V8 Land Cruiser. Well, V8 Land Cruiser or some sort of new dual cab. Yeah, yeah. They got a trailer full of all the Milwaukee or Makita or whatever it is. They got the $30,000 trailer, yeah. So, and I actually only said this to someone the other day that called me um, because I I get lots of people reaching out wanting advice and shit. And I was giving this person advice and everything I said, they had a comeback for. And I ended up saying to them, mate, you can give me all the excuses you want you're never going to change my mind because I've done that or worse. Mm. Like I've lost hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars. I've nearly been broke a couple of times. I've been fined by work cover and had to pay super back. I've, yeah. I've, I've like, I've had terrible situations. I've lost money on, like I've done everything that people give me excuses. And the way that I look at it now is if, if I can turn, like going from the person that I was to the person I am now, anybody can do it mm. because I was, mate, I had the shittest mindset. I thought I knew everything. I lost heaps of money. I, there is no excuse someone can give me. That, that you haven't made. That I, yeah, that I haven't made. Yeah. So you've got to put in the time and the effort. If you want something bad enough, you will make it happen. 100%. So what else you got for me, mate? I want you to leave this podcast today on fire. To You've given me a lot to think about. Honestly, I'm almost lost in my own head about it, but 
I want you to walk out of here today and go, I'm going to be a builder. I'm going to do this shit. I'm going to find out. I'm going to do whatever it takes. I'm going to be the best builder I can. Is it worth it? Is it worth being a builder? Yeah. A hundred percent. If uh, anyone that's followed me for a while, like I've talked about my story a lot. Like being a builder is the only thing that I ever wanted to be. Like I'm one of those lucky people that just, that's it. That's all I wanted to be from as long as young as I can remember. And so I became a builder. I did my, I dropped out of school when I was 15. Like, um, I actually got suspended from school about two weeks before the end of year 10. So I did it like I really didn't even finish year 10. Um, but I, yeah, like I just, I couldn't get an apprenticeship. So I went and worked in a truss and fame factory. Like I just, I took small steps. Like I worked there for two and a half years. So I was 15 years old and I loved it, mate. And I was working as hard as the guys that had been there mm. for 20 years. I worked my ass off. Um, and I bulked up I used to walk around the yard I used to be able to go out in the timber yard because I ended up being on the cutting benches with the huge saws and I used to be able to go out the timber yard grab um, six six metre 90 by 35s throw them on my shoulder carry them back to the saw bench I loved it yeah um, awesome. and then my old man's in the industry and he found out he got a one of his mates was looking for an apprenticeship so long story short got that didn't finish my apprenticeship um, started contracting, um, actually didn't finish my apprenticeship. I went and worked for my old boy for about 18 months painting and then developer he was working for, wanted carpenters, went and worked for him. Well, he said to me one afternoon, he said, hey, Dwayne, you're, you're a carpenter, aren't you? Like, why don't you get off the brush and mm. come and swing a hammer again? So um, that long story short, that led to me starting my contracting career, grew up a massive car, uh, um, contract carpentry business, did that until I had enough experience to get my builder's license went and did my builder's license course so i had my builder's license by the time i was 25 i think um and then literally 25 26 i think it was actually and literally by the time i was 32 mate i was out mm. i was ready to go and clean toilets and hated it hated the industry hated everything about it i'd lost hundreds and hundreds if not millions of dollars like just everything i'd worked for in my cut like i i had built up such a at a young age like investment portfolio of properties like all this stuff and literally within yeah six years of getting my bills license just had lost it um and the passion was gone so going from a point where losing it all starting again um and then getting to where i am now it is 150 percent worth it mm. when you so the biggest change in the last 10 years has been the amount of time money and energy i put in myself that is my number one thing now i'll invest whatever it takes time money energy in myself and then that has flown in like come back to developing systems and processes in my building business that are like nothing else in the industry uh, combined with joining up with the, my business partner Amelia Lee and creating Live Like Build yeah. and then taking everything that we were using in our building business with her knowledge from home owners and just taking that to the next level and now just the passion that I have now is just insane so absolutely it is worth it mm. but I think most people get they get so caught up in <coughs> thinking that as soon as they become a builder everything's going to be fine they're going to earn lots of money it doesn't happen you don't make money on some jobs don't you and they lose the passion very yeah. quickly so that is why like that those types of stories is why i like i said we've got people in live life build that are aren't even finished their apprenticeship yet aren't even haven't even got their builder's license yet mm -hmm. but they this story mate is ripe in our industry so these people are getting on the front foot they're putting in the dollars they're putting in the time they're putting in the effort so by the time they start their building business they've got all the documents in place they've got all the they understand all the contracts they've got all the mm. systems and processes ready to go they've got all the knowledge and experience they need to know how to build a team they know how to do their marketing yeah and they just hit the ground running that's awesome that's so good to hear that because that's what I'm, tr I'm trying to i'm trying to do that i'm trying to set myself up and 
that's awesome to hear that there's there's other people out there that are ambitious and want to grow and learn and, and set themselves up well to become great builders. You'll only ever get so far, mate, talking to people. You've got to spend time and money mm. to get yourself to the next level. How do you juggle? Because... I'm a young man. I have a partner. I, I love spending time with her. How do you juggle? Because it's addictive. The self improvement and the and the wanting to grow the business and to do all these things. How do you juggle it? Do you do schedule, personal scheduling? I do. No. The um, you've got to schedule things, mate. Yeah. So everyone, quite. I get told by a lot of people. I actually, had a guy pull me off on it the other day. Um, telling me that I, he he didn't think that I appreciated sleep and had, have I done enough homework and do I realize how important sleep is? So I had to tell him this whole story how I've never been a big sleeper and I've, I've had sleep apnea since my late 20s mm. and all this type of stuff. But I schedule, like I'm super big on scheduling now. Cla- so. Can you clarify what you mean by that? Because like, you know, I have... I have a calendar so, and I put my stuff in that and I have some to-do lists. So, What's scheduling for you? Um, so you've, I'll tr- I, I'd always get this story wrong, but I'll tell my version of it. So there's a story about a, a glass jar and filling it up. So if you have a glass jar and someone says, hey, fill that glass jar up and they give you some rocks. Yeah, so yeah. You, you put the rocks in there and you fill it up as much as you can and the person says, well... Is it full? You're like, yep, can't get any more rocks in there. So they give you pebbles. You put the pebbles in. The pebbles fill the gaps and go around the rocks. Is it full? Yep, can't fit any more in. Then they give you sand. Yeah. You pour the sand in. The sand fills all the little crevices and, and it fills it, jam-packed. Mm. And it's full. Yeah, no, it's not. So then they give you water. And you yeah. take the water in. The water seeps into the sand. Then you've got a full jar. Mm. So our lives are exactly the same. And it's all about being organized. So I do far more now than most people. I do more now in probably one day than a lot of people do in a week. And I, yet yeah, I've got more free time than what most people have. So, so many people say to me, you work too hard. Like, and you'll get a lot of this from family and friends the more that you start to improve. Mm-hmm. But family and friends constantly tell me, oh, you work too hard, Dwayne, you're always working. That's because that's all they see. They don't see that I'm like this weekend. I'm heading off Friday, uh, Saturday morning, mate. I'm going to my farm for three days. I'm building my driveway. I love the shit. Um, I spend a lot of time with my kids and my wife. Like we sit down every night. We like do shit with the kids, whether it's playing games, watching TV or Mm. documentaries or whatever. So the only reason we can do that is because we schedule everything. And this started um, in Live Life Bill. We do what we call uh, Sunday planning sessions. And that's in there because the first thing my wife and I did have to be, I don't know, six or eight years ago, everything was shit. We never had any time, we always run around, putting out fires, picking kids up, dropping kids off, mm. never seeing each other, racing around all day, cooking dinner, washing the dishes, cleaning up, kids go to bed, sit down for 10 minutes, go to bed, wake up, do it all again. And it was shit. And we're like, we can't keep doing this. Yeah. So my wife wanted to do some exercise, I wanted to do some exercise. Um, she put in Pilates in the calendar. I put in, I started going bushwalking with some mates on mm. a Tuesday morning. And mate, it was only a couple of weeks and we we're like, holy shit, like our conversations are changing. Like you're actually, she's getting time to do a couple of exercise sessions. People are asking me, hey, need to meet you on site tomorrow. I'm like, oh no, it's Tuesday. I've got something booked in. I can't meet you. I'll, I'll meet you at nine o'clock or I'll meet you on Wednesday. And so we just kept adding to it. So Mm. I'm a massive fan that you have to fill your calendar with all your personal stuff first. And you can do this whether you're an employee or an employer. Um, You just got to juggle it around to make it work. So if you want to do your exercise, put that in. Like, so in my calendar, family holidays, long weekends, take the kids to school, pick the kids up, date nights, like all the personal stuff goes in first and then the business fits around it. Like I'm the business owner, so it's a bit more flexible. But like, I might go out for breakfast with mates, or cat, go out for a work lunch or something. But then I'll sit in the, I'll put the kids to bed, and I'll sit in the office two hours. So mm. I do far more hours in a week than what my guys do on site. But I'm just more flexible with the way I move my hours around. With my team, I encourage them to do all this stuff as well. 
and tell me like if you want to drop kids at school like let us know let's work it into our job schedules if your kid's got a school event on or they got a sports event on like let's get it in the schedule like Mm -hmm. i want my team doing the personal stuff just as much as i'm doing the personal stuff um so yeah our calendars are filled with personal stuff and the business stuff fits around it but mate i'm the type of person if i don't have shit listed out i call it white noise like I will sit on Instagram for an hour and flick through shit. I will jump on YouTube or I'll... you got to fill up your time or else you waste it. And that's the biggest problem. Like, that's one of the biggest things is people are spending their time just doing shit that they don't need to be doing. Stuff that's not adding value to them, to their mm. family, to their business. So, I get it. You're, you're young, you've got a partner, you want to spend time together, but just have a schedule that's cool yeah because i was thinking and this is what a lot of people think i guess is no i need to cut back on stuff i guess there's a time and a place to do that but maybe not just cut back but let's reorganize and then you don't have to cut back that's my biggest thing to people now when they tell me they don't have time to do things and can't fit everything in is to go to your phone and see how much time you spend on social media Hmm. so if you're if anyone sits in front of me or tries to tell me on the phone now that I, I can't fit it in. I can't. I don't have an hour to spend on Live Life Build working on my business. But you spend three hours on all Facebook, right, yeah. Go to your phone, go through all your apps. Tell, like, tell me right now, like, how many, what's it saying you've spent on social media today? Yeah. Uh, 20 minutes. All right, so 20 minutes. Let's say that's, that's what you're doing every day. 20 minutes is seven days in a week. Builds up. It adds up. So Mm -hmm. that's just over two hours. So if you're spending 20 minutes a day on social media, that's two hours and 20 minutes. Don't tell me you've got no time. Especially when you're spending hours on social media. That builds up real quick then. Mate, there is nobody on this planet that is spending 20 minutes. Most people are spending two hours a day. Yeah. So I don't have any time or I can't fit shit in is not an excuse because you have the time. You just wasting it no that's cool no that's you definitely <laughs> it's a lot to take in uh you've given me a lot to think about that's awesome it's yeah i'm keen to to take what you said and, and go home and, and actually have a sit down and think about it and actually take the time to look kind of all over it and finish it if my advice to you mate is finish your apprenticeship yeah that's like definitely I, gonna happen yeah I didn't, like I said, I didn't finish my apprenticeship. Um, I was lucky enough, I, my boss signed me off. I, I'd finished all my TAFE stuff. But look, I learnt more being thrown in the deep end. And this is why I say to my team, like, don't worry about the young guys stuffing up. Like, everything, as long as they don't stuff up the same thing 20 times, mm. like, everyone is going to make a few mistakes. But I learnt so much by just jumping in the deep end telling and my like i used to tell people yeah i can do that no worries all i I remember like literally a couple of months after i started contracting um i had to do this big deck and this like octagon gazebo thing i'd never done anything like in my life and mate um i remember i jumped online i bought a um roofing book that showed you like had all the angles and the Mm -hmm. seat cuts and the burr's mouth and everything i needed and Yes, it cost me a bit of money because I had to buy a few extra pieces of timber because I cut a few wrong. Yeah. But I jumped in the deep end, mate. Yeah. I, I, I rang some chippies I know. I talked to people and I built a octagon gazebo and yeah. it was perfect. Yeah. I made a few mistakes, but, and I just kept improving. Like, so. You just got to give it a shot. Uh, I, I've, I've done that a few times. I've said yes to clients with out actually having any knowledge of what i'm doing and then i jump back in the car and the first thing i've done is is called a builder that i know hey how do i do this or i go home and spend all this time studying and researching how you do it just give things a crack you got to give things a crack you got to believe in yourself like i said it's that one percent if you never try you're never going to know 100 percent. well mate look uh thanks very much for coming on today hope i haven't been too hard on you no no um, it's, it's good to hear it's good to hear yeah i'll uh, stay in touch and i look forward to seeing where things go mate awesome cheers Dwayne. are you ready to build smarter live better and enjoy life then head over to livelifebuild.com forward slash elevate to get started
Everything discussed during the Level Up podcast with me, Dwayne Pierce, is based solely on my own personal experiences and those experiences of my guests. The information, opinions and recommendations presented in this podcast are for general information only and any reliance on the information provided in this podcast is done at your own risk. We recommend that you obtain your own professional advice in respect to the topics discussed during this podcast.